I'd like to note that uh, there will be a talk, but then there's time for question and answers um, afterward. Thank you all for your interest in the future of graduate education at the University of Iowa. So if you were able to attend last year's address, or if you've seen the video from last year's address, you know that we left you with two video themes related to the future of graduate education. Quite frankly, the first one didn't work out so well. The Cubs didn't win the World Series in 2015. That's the bad news. The good news is they made an awful lot of progress. We're looking forward to continued progress, much like we're looking forward to continued progress in graduate education. And on a more serious note, we left you with a different challenge from the second video theme as well. So we challenged you with that address last year to what were you prepared to do to help improve graduate education, to re-envision our graduate education programs and the future of our students. Well, it turns out over this past year, we've learned that you've done quite a lot. <clears throat> We all have on, as we, on campus, the graduate college, our individual programs, and other colleges. I'd like to talk a little bit about what's gone on. Two major projects have led me to this belief that substantial progress is being made. The first one being that, is that the graduate college completed a self-study of our operations um, that will lead to a formal review of the college later this summer and into the early fall. What we've learned from that and what we did our self-retrospective analysis of our operations, we've changed our oper you know, the administrative operations of the college, and we've changed our priorities about how we support our students while they're here and while they move into the future. The second project is a major undertaking to review all of the PhD programs yet again. We affectionately call this Task Force 2.0 because about six years ago in 2009-2010, then Provost Wallace Lowe charged the Graduate College with undertaking a review of all of our graduate programs on campus. That affectionately became known in our office as Task Force 1.0. We've seen substantial change and improvements as we've come to learn as we're reviewing these programs over the course of time. Um, that leads me to believe that we're, we have a very positive trajectory of where we're going. Now, some people throughout this period have discussed with me They've demonstrated a fair amount of skepticism about what we can do to improve our programs and, quite frankly, some criticism. But I'd like to point out that substantial progress is being made with these programs as we look forward to our work. Let me talk a little bit about some of these. The first one is student success. We've seen substantial uh, progress in terms of student success. If you look at some standard metrics of progress in terms of a higher level of completion of our doctoral students and a reduced time to degree of our PhD students. We've seen curricular innovations and since that report in 2010 we've seen almost 90 different program actions at the graduate level that have led to improvements in our graduate programs. Some of these were restructuring, adding new sub programs, changing some names to make them more relevant for the future of graduate education in those disciplines. We saw some terminations, quite frankly, of programs that were no longer viable or sustainable, or the colleges wanted to move in a different direction away from that, that particular program with their resource allocations. And we've also had some exciting new programs be approved. The most recent one of which was a program out of the College of Business, the Business Analytics Program at the Master's and Certificate level, which serves several purposes. One is to help students transition from their undergraduate work into graduate education to be better prepared when they pursue different employment positions with this degree, and also a distance learning program that helps people who are out in the workforce increase their skills in the ever competitive business world. We've seen substantial intellectual synergies from these program reviews. We've learned that many programs are starting to think about how they might synergize their, their work with other programs, other disciplines, to how they can collaborate to work together. And perhaps the most notable example of an intellectual synergy was a major recommendations from the previous task force report that took a number of years to actually come to fruition. And we expect in April, in just a few weeks, that the Board of Regents will approve a brand new umbrella interdisciplinary program in the biomedical sciences, basically collapsing eight of the 11 biomedical programs on campus 
into one umbrella program with very flexible sub-program offerings under that umbrella. We believe that there are some possibilities from the reviews again in other areas on campus that might consider this option. Funding for graduate students is always a concern for us. We've learned and we've worked very hard to support students on an individual basis. We know that the compensation that our students receive ranks among the top five or so in our AAU peer group, public peer group. So our funding is very substantial in that regard in terms of stipends, in terms of tuition scholarships and health benefits to our students. We've also learned from our program reviews that programs are now um, on a majority sort of basis in terms of the number of programs offering substantial five-year packages of support for their students using the resources that they have at their disposal. Now what we'd like to see, however, and the graduate college is working hard to strategically reuse our resources, is to fill in gaps where we see them um, uh, arising with students because a student in some disciplines may be only supported by teaching assistantships through their time in their program, or on the other side of the coin in the STEM fields from research assistantships. We'd like to see a balance of that, and we've redeployed our resources to help um, in this regard and to help fund more students than we have last year. This current fiscal year, we're supporting about 100 more students than we did last year because of the redeployment of our resources. And finally, we know from anecdotal stories listening to students over the years and through exit surveys of our students that career placement and career advising um, is a high priority for them, for the programs, and for our college. And just to give you an example, that a major emphasis out of our graduate success office these past two years is we've seen over 2,000 individual appointments and students coming to our workshops and seminars about professional development opportunities and how to help advance their careers. So we're making a lot of progress on campus. You've reacted to what our charge was last year, but we believe that there's more work that can be done. And there's several reasons that we need to keep looking forward. The topic of the future of graduate education has been ongoing for a number of years. I would argue about a decade, really, in a level of intensity that arose from the National Research Council assessment of doctoral programs that, that came out in the late 2008-2009 period, but started in about 2005. Now, quite frankly, this report did not become as effective as the NRC would have liked, but what it did do was it sparked huge national de debate and discussion about the future of graduate education and how we need to respond to future challenges. This started with white papers from the Council of Grad Schools, The Path Forward, about the future of graduate education, and another report that they produced, The Pathways in Rethinking Graduate Education for Career Development. It's also been on the minds of various intellectual and research leaders in our country. You can see Janet Napolitano, who's the president of the University of California system, she basically chided and scolded the graduate deans at a national meeting a few years ago and that we are not doing a good enough job in advocating on behalf of graduate education to various stakeholders. And she argued that if we do not advocate for ourselves, then who's going to do that for us? We need to, need to do a better job of this um, at all levels. Other research leaders in the bottom right, uh, Alan Leshner, who is one of the chief editors of Science Magazine, has been rethinking graduate education in those, perspective, those perspectives from the STEM and biomedical workforce areas. And our campus here at the University of Iowa has invited intellectual thinkers and writers about these issues. Uh, Leonard Casuto was here in the fall talking about graduate education. And more recently, Keith Yamamoto from the University of California, San Francisco, a famous biochemical, biomedical uh, um, scientist, and one of the authors of the NIH Workforce Report has been talking about changes that they believe need to occur in graduate education as well. And finally, one of the things that's come up most recently is another invited presentation uh, conference from the Council of Graduate Schools, and this is also happening in other circles as well, in other disciplinary circles, about what the future of graduate education is like, is going to be like, and specifically, what is the future of the dissertation, which is the major culminating event and activity of a doctoral program. So let's think about our graduate education programs and what they traditionally have been built around. So this is Nilo Kure, 
Nilo was a graduate student here, a PhD student in cinema and film studies, and is now a tenure track faculty member at the University of Michigan. Okay, a successful student. There are other examples of this type of student that I personally have known and worked with over the years. An example I can think of off the top of my head is Sarah Vigmastet, who was the graduate student Senate president, graduate council member. She graduated from her, her program in biomedical engineering, is now an associate professor in that department. Another example of this type of individual that's moved on to a faculty position immediately after their graduate program is Laura Fry Law, who is now in the physical rehabilitation science and physical therapy program as a tenured associate professor. So three examples of individuals who moved right into tenure track faculty positions. But we know this is not the, the only mechanism of a career option for our students. First of all, it's just not possible with the number of PhD students being produced in the United States and at the University of Iowa to have an equivalent number of positions that they can immediately walk into. So these positions are not available. And what we've come to learn over the years through stories and talking to students that have come into our office and through our professional development programs is that an increasing number of students don't want to pursue that track with their PhD. They're looking at other kinds of options, but they may be afraid to tell their mentor about this because of fear of retribution or being ostracized in their own program. So we have to think about how we expand our vision of success of graduate education in our doctoral programs. And here's another example why we need to think about this expansion of the definition of success. We've learned from our, the beginnings of our NRC study when we put together our data to submit that for the analysis, we needed to put together information about our doctoral placement, what our students were doing. This is a culmination of information from reported doctoral placement from that report and subsequent to that report that indicates that only about 20 to 25 percent of our students move into tenure track positions either immediately after or shortly thereafter their doctoral program. So if we were only to define and to leave the 20 percent as being successful from our PhD programs, what does that say about the other 80 percent? I would argue that an expansion of our definition of success is mandatory in this day and age, and I'll give you four examples of why I think that's the case. This is an example of one of those um, individuals who has moved into a non-academic career. This is Bridget Coughlin. Bridget graduated with a PhD in biochemistry in 1999, and after a series of uh, non-academic positions out in the workforce, in early April, she will assume the presidency and become the chief executive officer of the Shedd Aquarium in Chicago. And in a recent conversation with Bridget, she mentioned that the interdisciplinary research and the ability to communicate science to a wide variety of audiences while she was in graduate school formed the basis of how she could work in a non-academic environment and inspired her to move into a different kind of career than many of her cohorts in her program. One of the most telling uh, quotes from that conversation was the fact that she said, I may have a PhD in biochemistry, but over the years I believe I've earned a doctorate in leveraging human capital. Hmm. Pretty telling words from an individual who's moved on to a successful career. Let's consider the path of Sanjeev Malhotra. After getting his undergraduate degree in engineering from his, in his home country of India, Sanjeev came to the United States and pursued an MBA from the University of Iowa in 1992 and later a PhD in chemical biochemical engineering. Sanjeev is now going to head up a major project in the Department of Energy in Washington and clean energy investment at that center in Washington. Let's consider some more recent examples. This is Eliza Sanders, a recent PhD graduate in English literature. Eliza moved into a position um, as a communications director Assistant Communications Director in the Th Philanthropic Foundation at the Field Museum in Chicago. Another example, the final one is, let's consider Tawanda Owens. Tawanda also graduated recently last May from our College of Education and is now the As Associate Director of Training and Planning at the Cultural Unity and Engagement Center, University of Colorado Boulder. So the Graduate College would like to think that these four examples and others like them are highly successful individuals as well. So what does that mean then for how we prepare our students for a future? Well, we've thought long and hard about this, and we're sitting there thinking about the future and how do we plan for the future. 
let's take a look to the future. So we see a student here, knowing that she's going to go somewhere, doesn't know exactly where. Where do you think her path's going to lead? I would like to think that her path, when she finishes walking down that road, is going to lead to a creative, innovative graduate program at the University of Iowa. <laughs> Let's consider the plight of another student. This is Sebastian D. Pasquale. Perhaps that other student is going to pursue the same path as Sebastian. Let's listen to his path in his own words. Beginning in astronomy and seeing the challenges of that led me to reflect on my own interest in physics research, to also reflect on the nature of astronomy with other departments of physics and how professors interact. And what I enjoyed about the other students that were pursuing astronomy to kind of collect what were my personal goals for my career? What things did I think were necessary for me to succeed? And I've been building on that uh, to been exposed to more research and positive physics here. Now, the graduate college knows Sebastian very well. He's probably one of the most engaged graduate students that we've encountered in our time as we started our graduate education, uh, graduate success office. Sebastian's been a teaching assistantship. He's applied for external research grants and fellowships. He's involved in communicating science, both to donors for the graduate college and the particular slide that we showed. He was actually communicating science to high school students at Kennedy High School in Cedar Rapids. This is an individual that's trying to take advantage of every opportunity that is crossing his path, path because he doesn't know exactly what he wants to do. He certainly is considering faculty-type positions, but he's open to other kinds of pathways as well. We would like to think that this is the kind of student that we have to prepare ourselves for as we move into the future. Now, how to do this? <clears throat> now, the Graduate College has thought long and hard about this, and we've been working with campus partners to develop what we would believe is a series of competencies or experiences, experiences that all graduate students should have to be involved in, regardless of what their career path is going to be. We like to think of students that have had teaching experience, that understand how to communicate both verbally and in the written form, have leadership skills, understand career development, what might be possible for them, and, and particularly how to fund themselves when they get out into those positions. We'd like them to also explore and to certainly understand wellness principles of how to balance quality of life with their careers, un understanding diverse activities, diversity issues, multicultural issues that they're going to have, a fa uh, have to face and en engage with um, in a meaningful way as they move into different kinds of careers. We'd like them to be doing all of this kind of work, however, without forgetting that the predominant activity in a PhD program is high quality research and scholarship. So how do we undertake this sort of thing? What would a graduate educational program look like if we're trying to incorporate these themes? Let me talk about four different programs that the Graduate College is trying to, trying to undertake right now that is moving in this direction. One of the things that we've uh, undertaken, taken a little risk, and what we've tried to do is we have engaged with a number of our alumni um, and opened up what we've called an Open Doors series. This is essentially an online video webinar that our, some of our alumni in various areas um, partake in and are literally asked questions by people calling in and uh, working with the, the alumni out in their workplace or at home in some cases. And we've had students that, you know, former students, alumni who have been in the areas of teaching in a liberal arts college or working in the private sector and research, other students who are trying to think about startup companies and develop patents for their work and moving in this direction, or those who are working like Eliza Sanders in storytelling about how to communicate in different kinds of forms um, to help in philanthropic kinds of activities. This has just got started this semester and it's only a couple of months old, but we've had over 400 students participate in these activities thus far. So we think this is moving in a positive direction. One of the things that we think is critically important for students in the future is inter interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary perspectives and research and scholarly activities. Let me just talk about a few um, key activities that are going on uh, from graduate college programs. There are many, many across the campus that are, that are occurring as well. But let's consider the work of students and faculty in the School of Urban and Regional Planning. These folks are working with 
faculty and students in other disciplines like economics, public health, some engineering disciplines to help local communities and communities throughout our state re-envision what their communities might look like in the future, working on specific problems that communities might have. They're doing this work through a, a really innovative program called the Iowa Initiative for Sustainable Communities, which extends all the way from cities in the Mississippi River all the way over to the Missouri River on the western part of the state. Or let's consider faculty and students working in the Center for the Book. The Center for the Book just created a new Master of Fine Arts in Book Studies that is incredibly exciting, fully enrolled with students that are moving in this direction of trying to, trying to engage and bring together both the science and the artistry of how to preserve research and scholarship in the written word. They're now extending these themes to working with students and faculty in the School of Library and Information Science who are working on the same activity but preservation in digital formats. And faculty in the Library and Information Science have helped put together, along with other campus colleagues, a new graduate certificate in digital humanities, which is exceptionally exciting for students working in this area that want to move in a different direction with their work. Finally, I want to talk a little bit about a, new, a program that's been around for a number of years, but which has actually led to a new university initiative. This is the Interdisciplinary Graduate Program in, in, in Informatics. Having its start originally in health informatics and bioinformatics, there are now new subtracts in geoinformatics and actually moving into cultural informatics through connections with the, the Digital Humanities Certificate. Exciting new opportunities in the Graduate College and also others on campus as well. There are a number of others. Other possibilities through this PhD program review in terms of interdisciplinary work and the power behind that philosophy. But let's talk about the power of interdisciplinary work for individual students. And I'd like to introduce you to Kirk Phillips. Kirk used to work in the health insurance industry in Des Moines, and he came back to the university and was very interested in how healthcare decisions could be made using big data that comes out of insurance decisions and things like this. So what Kirk did was he charted his own path. He got faculty interested in what he was doing. He developed and was successful in completing an interdisciplinary PhD in health informatics. A few other students came behind him, looked at the same sorts of plans of studies, developed their own little nuances in what they were doing, and lo and behold, that work over the years became the impetus behind the health informatics subtrack in the interdisciplinary program that we have now. I'd like to introduce you to a current student. This is Erica Damon. Erica is a noted artist, photographer, uh, she draws, if you go to a, sit in a meeting with her, she draws her notes in pictures. I sat with her at the Oberman Institute celebration this weekend. Everything she does in her notes is, is put in from words into pictures that she draws in her notebook. Incredibly talented young woman who is very interested in, in the environment and how mankind is impacting the environment. She's developed and is working on an individual PhD program with Barbara Eckstein, who I thought I saw a walk in earlier, in environmental humanities. There she is. Environmental humanities. Exciting potential for this student. So the power of interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary work is ever present on our campus. We're also concerned with diversity efforts and multiculturalism that our students will need to be faced with when they leave our campus. And this extends out of the work of our Office of Graduate Inclusion that's working very hard on these issues in our, in our university and out of our college. They're most noted, perhaps, for their work with bringing in very talented, high potential, underrepresented students who are undergraduates from across the country to work with faculty on campus through our program called the Summer Research Opportunity Program, or what we call affectionately the SHRAP program. A number of you that are sitting in this room I know of, of, have mentored students in this program, and highly successful. Even though we're one of the smaller programs, SHRAP programs in the Big Ten group of, of schools, we have the highest percentage of students that have participated in our program that have moved on to graduate education, both at the University of Iowa and at other institutions, more than anybody else in the Big Ten. That's just one example. We work on trying to partner with programs and to recruit students to campus as well, underrepresented students to campus. We help support individual students with financial resources, and we provide resources to programs that have uh, federally, federal uh, grants that are specifically targeted to underrepresentation as well. So we're trying to support programs and students in a variety of different ways. 
One of the other things that OGI has done very, very well is put on a number of workshops and seminars on topics that are related to multiculturalism, culturalism, and diversity across a broad spectrum of topics. They also help sponsor our certificate in multicultural understanding as well. And finally, let me tell you a little bit about our last initial project that we're working on. And that is how we engage publicly with our scholarship. How do we communicate our work to the public? We do this in a variety of different ways, both out of the graduate college and across campus. A number of faculty who are here tonight have, got, have received a supplemental grant to their original training grant that allows students to learn how to communicate science in a digital format. And this has got exciting new potential in where they're going with this particular project. Another example of how we're trying to help students better communicate their work is through our three-minute thesis competition, which essentially doctoral students learn how to um, talk about their project in layman's terms in a three-minute period of time. We had the first round of competitions here in this room last week, and over 40 students participated in that activity. It was remarkably cool to see how these students were able to talk about their work in layman's terms to, in three minutes. The 10 finalists will be presenting their work in the final competition at the Jacobson Memorial Graduate Research Conference coming up at the end of the month. Another activity that the University of Iowa is only one of several public institutions to implement through their graduate program is the requirement for thesis and dissertation students to deposit a public abstract of their work in addition to their dissertation and the technical abstract, which has been a longstanding um, activity with the dissertation. This public abstract essentially repeats what the, the three-minute thesis does, but in, in the written word, and students have about 250 words to be able to describe their project so that we can talk about that to, to publicly engaged individuals. Again, I mentioned we were only one of a couple of public institutions to implement this, this activity, this requirement. And I can tell you the power of this is because Eliza Sanders, the individual I talked about earlier, who's now at the Field Museum, was required to submit writing samples for that job interview, and she submitted her public abstract for that work. So these, these activities have high value for students when they want to try to communicate what they're doing. And finally, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk a little bit about the work of the Oberman Center. The Oberman Graduate Institute uh, celebrated its 10th anniversary this past weekend. In its 10-year history, they've, they've been able to help over 150 students and probably a couple of dozen faculty learn how to publicly engage their research, their teaching, and their scholarship with public engagement and with public uh, input and uh, give and take back and forth. So a number of different activities that are working in this area to try to help our students understand how to engage the public. So what about the future? Well, I, would, I certainly would not argue with you that the future is somewhat unpredictable and it is daunting. But we've made substantial, uh, persistent strategic progress, and I think we can do more. Let me try to explain. My approach at the Graduate College is that I think we need to pursue excellence through innovation. Let me talk a little bit about what I mean here. Excellence through innovation has a number of different perspectives that we need to employ, and we need to re-envision what our graduate programs will be like. So, if I was asked to think about how to develop a new graduate program, and I had no experience doing this, or had, had to start off with a brand new program, those of you who work in the Graduate College and some of my, some of my colleagues that are here know that when I am, I'm forced with these kinds of perspectives, when I don't know where to start, I like to think about going back to the beginning. How would I start from scratch to develop something? And my notion of developing a doctoral program would be that we need to think about a more student-centric model of how we develop a student that has both some teaching experience, some research experience, in a number of other these competency building activities built into their, their program so that they can then move into a career of their choice when they leave our institution. I mentioned this last year and I will mention it again, is that we can no longer, I believe, bring in students 
that have to help us with our undergraduate teaching mission, purely for that reason, or to help purely fund our research mission. Students need to have those experiences, but we need to think about a more holistic approach of how we develop our student through their PhD program. I believe we can do this by recruiting students that are high quality, that have a high degree of potential to complete the degree, as long as they have the appropriate amount of funding, perhaps an individual development plan and plans of study that will help them move through this program of research and have intense mentoring that will allow them to complete the degree in a reasonable period of time that's appropriate for that discipline. So if we look at where I think we have been in the past, and we still are a little bit in this mode, quite frankly, but we're getting out of it, we're making some progress, is that the traditional tenure track academic position has been the, the career of choice or by design of many faculty. This has been the traditional route, the traditional scholar working independently on a project to help create new knowledge for a particular discipline. I think that needs to change and it is changing. Now what do we need to do to get to a broader view, more holistic view about the potential of our students to move in different directions with their careers? How are we going to do that? Well again, excellence through innovation, I think we can do this through increased collaboration. We can do this by inculcating interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary research. We can do this by publicly engaged scholarship. And we can do it by intense and enhanced professional development of our students, all leading to the place where there are increased numbers of options for our students, career options for our students to pursue. It's not that we're moving away from tenure track faculty being, a, being an interesting choice and a, and, a, and a viable choice for our students, but we know that's not going to be possible for all the PhD students that we um, move through our programs and have graduate. We need to think about other career options and how do we prepare them for that. I think we can do this on our campus. We're starting to see signs where programs are thinking along this direction. The Graduate College wants to help you move along in this direction as well. So it's time for something new. So one of my major challenges here is I think we're a place that I would like to see us start is with the future of the dissertation. And I mentioned that there's been some discussion amongst disciplinary groups, the Modern Language Association, the American Historical Association, the Council of Graduate Schools has started to think about the future of the dissertation. And let's go back to think about how the dissertation came to be. Okay, if I you know, remember that the University of Iowa was one of 60 domestic AAU institutions, the research one institutions of our country. There are several from Canada as well in this group. And it's the AAU that sets the tone for the vision of graduate education, the value of graduate education, and how PhD training gets conducted. So back in 1900, educational historians will tell you back in 1900 when the AAU was founded, basically, the gist of the graduate program was to learn a bunch of stuff from high scholars in the area, you do some examinations, and you conduct a cogent intellectual project, which at that time was designed to take one academic year. My, how times have changed. Okay? So, I'm not saying we go back to one year of dissertation research, but I think we need to re-envision what the dissertation is currently and what it could be as we move into the future. Let me give you a pers personal example about this. I was entering my sixth year of my PhD program, merrily moving along. My, department, my uh, committee chair said, you know, we need to have a meeting for uh, see what your progress is like. I said, fine. He said, you know, you're, you've, you've been here a little while. You know, you, where, where are you at with this stuff? So we had a, we had a, a committee meeting. The committee unanimously said, you know, John, you're, you're, you should be done. You set out to answer a question, you devise the research design for it, you receive data, you interpret it, you're done. And I said, yeah, but I just got done running this other experiment that leads me to several more questions. And they said, that's all well and good, but what you're doing is you're developing a program of research for your career. Remember that you can't put your entire career into your dissertation. This is back in the early 80s, okay? So the format for doing a dissertation, as far as I know, there was only one format at Northwestern University. You wrote the traditional document, the sort of the book. 
so we did that. So the com committee and I got together when I was getting ready to leave, and they said, you know, when we agree, we think we could get probably six research manuscripts out of this work. Now, if dissertations, again, by the original design and how it's evolved over the years, is to how to bring high-level scholarship and new knowledge to the public domain as rapidly as possible, is that the way to do it through a dissertation, or do you do it by other formats? And the reason I say this is I've thought about this a lot in the last six or eight months, and that my dissertation, quite frankly, was not cited very much by UMI microfilms, to be brutally honest. But two of the five papers, I didn't get the sixth one to the chagrin of my PhD advisor, two of the five papers were highly cited at that time. And I sit back and reflect to myself, well, how much, how much of this research did I really need to do to document that I knew how to do research? that I could go off and have an independent career. Was it the two papers that were really highly cited? Was it three? Was it the five? I don't know the answer to that question, but I sit back and think, if I would have done two or three solid papers out of that work, I probably could have had more time to develop other competencies that probably would have helped me along the way, rather than learning them the hard way when I became a faculty member. So I think we can do this at the University of Iowa, and the reason I say that is, you know, if you think about graduate education, we accept musical scores for the Doctor of Musical Arts. We accept poetry and short stories in our, in our writing programs as a documentation of the scholarship in those disciplines. We accept sculptures from artists, pottery. We have stuff in the grad college that graduate students have, have produced. We accept various forms of scholarship and research and creative work. Why can't we think about a different format for the dissertation and what the dissertation means in the breadth of our doctoral programs? I think the University of Iowa could be a leader in this area, and I would challenge the campus to help us work in that direction. So this is going to take some, some rethinking, and it's going to take some re-envisioning out of the graduate college and out of the campus. And we're going to propose several things tonight that will move in this direction. We want to use our infrastructural resources in the graduate college, our personnel, our financial resources, and our technology to help us move in this direction. The first place that we want to start with is placement data. And I talked a little bit about that data and that pie chart earlier, but I didn't tell you at that time that that was reported placement data. And about 25% of our doctoral graduates since about 2006 go unreported. We don't know what they're doing or where they're at. We need more complete information for several reasons. One is to be able to report this when AAU metrics are finally decided upon somewhere down the line. They're working on that. And also, we need to be able to look at our programs and say, you know, you're preparing students and they're moving off to these different directions. If you knew exactly where they were going, the complete cohorts of your group that have graduated, you may be able to redesign your program to help them in a more positive way move in that direction. Let's think prospectively, not sort of retrospectively, with how we design our programs. Second thing is we want to host a series of ideation meetings with partners on campus. Remember that we're completing a self-study and a review of the college. I'm sure there are going to be recommendations out of that review that are going to be interesting to discuss with the campus and with the administration. And we're also getting ready to complete soon a, the review of the PhD programs on campus, which I'm certain will have recommendations as well. We want to work with the campus to think about how we can move forward with our graduate programs and make more progress, yet even more progress than we already have. We've talked a little bit about the power of interdisciplinary work, and we support financially a number of our interdisciplinary graduate, formal interdisciplinary programs with uh, uh, financial resources. We want to do the same thing for students who are working at these intersections between these disciplines. Imagine what could have happened or how many other students would move in this direction if we supported them um, with individual interdisciplinary fellowships, the kinds of work that Erica and Kirk have done with their careers. And finally, we want to figure out a way to redeploy our resources in a strategic fashion to create challenge grants for programs to undergo innovative change. By this I mean two things to start off with. There are probably other ideas. One is we want to be able to, there's programs again that we know from the reviews that are thinking about interdisciplinary connections. We want to help foster that conversation. 
and some resources moving them in this direction might be an incentive to move a little faster or to rethink how they might move in that direction. Second of all, if we can combine some new resources that people can use to envision new programs, combined with their placement data, they might think about how to redesign their graduate program that meets the needs and the interests of the types of students that they bring in and the careers that they might matriculate into. So we're thinking about several different sorts of things in the graduate college. So all these different kind of things are all sort of put together to require a lot of work, more thinking, innovative thinking that I know this campus is capable of doing. We want to partner with you, all in the name of preparing for the future. I'll introduce you to Nathaniel Coleman, Jr. Nathaniel got his PhD back last May, and it's Nathaniel and his colleagues that are graduating in the last couple of years, soon to graduate and are now entering our programs and will graduate in the future, that are gonna be the leaders in the 21st century that are gonna be faced with the challenges, some of which we don't even know what they are yet. We need to figure out a best way that we can pair these individuals as we move into the future. So let me, in summary, let me sort of reiterate the charge to the campus and to ourselves, is we need to prepare for the future. We need to embrace the challenges that the future will bring. We need to change these challenges into opportunities. And with these opportunities, we need to partner together to think strategically and take some innovative, creative risks to move forward with it success in graduate education that leads to improved student success and programs of distinction. So thank you very much.